nice to see application you might not have talked about. How can you use optics for things you didn't necessarily tell me? Okay, so Manuel already gave you a bit of it. I'm, I'm Paul Hill. I work up at Dalhousie University, which is in Halifax, which is a little bit east of here in, in Nova Scotia. And I've uh, come down to talk about sediment and optics for a few years now to the optics class. And it's always a treat because you get to see people from all different backgrounds, students from all different backgrounds and all different perspectives here. And that's a neat thing about this, this class. Um, I uh, got into optics by accident. Um, it, Basically, you know, there was a simple question when I was in graduate school, which was a while ago. Um, I was in an area, I, was, I went to University of Washington, and uh, it, the whole Pacific Northwest was an area where, where optics were being developed as a, as a tool to figure out what was in the water column, in particular in the early days, how much mass was in the water column. And uh, when I got to graduate school, it was really clear that this shouldn't work at all. There were all sorts of papers saying that this is nonsense, it shouldn't work uh, because of particle size sensitivity of uh, optics to uh, the relationship between optics and mass. So that's something that stuck in the back of my head for a long time. Um, why should optics work for, for estimating sediment mass? And that led me to uh, to uh, start collaborating with people like Emmanuel, who liked uh, good basic questions like that. And we've been, uh, we've been working on this stuff ever since, and it's expanded much beyond just using optics to estimate mass. It's, uh, as you'll see, it's, it's expanded into um, other aspects of particles as well. So is there a pointer in here somewhere? <coughs> First, this little button is the laser. If you want to plug the thing in, that button changes one slide to the next. All right. I like the plug in. Oh, I won't worry about it. Yeah. Um, okay, so what I'm here to talk about today is, is characterization of, of uh, sediment properties with optics. Um, and I use this image from the North Shore of Kauai um, to show that we ought to be able to do this, all right? You know, we can see with our eye what beautiful blue oligotrophic water looks like, and we can see the unfortunate uh, love of my life, uh, what mud can do to the uh, color of the water column. This is in an area which has had some irresponsible development up in the highlands, so when they have uh, big um, thunder storms and storms on the rainiest spot on earth up at the top of Kauai, um, the rivers are introducing sediment into these beautiful coral reef environments, which is not good. Um, so anyways, if we can see it here, we ought to be able to do it with instruments. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so why do we care at all about sediment? Well, I, I chose uh, three of the biggies here. There's many other reasons, but, but three of the biggest reasons are the first one is that suspended sediment blocks light, um, and that has an effect on the productivity of, of coastal ecosystems or freshwater ecosystems, um, and, uh, and it, it also has an aesthetic effect on the water body. This is looking down from an airplane, as you might guess, uh, down into the, the uh, Lake Ontario near Toronto after some tremendous thunderstorms, and you can see these fantastic plumes of, of sediment that's uh, uh, extending out into Lake Ontario. Not everybody thinks this looks good, so there's an aesthetic effect of suspended sediment uh, as well as a, a biogeochemical effect. Um, the other, uh, another big uh, reason to study sediments is that they carry pollutants. The fine sediments that I study, the, the clays and silts, have tremendous surface area per unit mass, and many um, contaminants are hydrophobic, so they glom onto those surfaces. So the fate of those fine sediments are intimately tied to the, to the fate of the pollutants. And then finally, deposited sediment takes up space. So it, it uh, poses a navigational hazard in, in harbors. So those are, those are three of the biggies. Other ones that, that I'm not going to talk about, well, I'm not going to talk about any of those actually, but uh, um, that sediments store an environmental record. So, so sedimentologists like myself are interested in figuring out how to interpret that that record. Okay. No response from the... <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's trying to get me to join Tempest again. <laughs> 
being coerced. Um, so why would we use optics to study sediments? Why don't we just go out and collect them? And that's because the collection of sediment is, is difficult. Um, often sediment is found in extreme environments and extreme conditions. I can tell you the bow here was really extreme. Not so extreme where Tim Milligan was there <laughs> laughing at me. But, uh, um, and also characterization of sediment is time consuming. I hope you've had the chance in this class to do lots of filtration, weighing, and uh, maybe not measuring the size distribution directly, but all these things take a lot of time. So what we want is proxies for sediment that we can deploy in remote and extreme environments and that don't take as much time. So that, that's the real draw of using optics to interrogate sediments. Um, so uh, this is just another, um, because it's after lunch. Um, so this is, this is Hawaii again. Uh, these, this was a great day. Um, I was probably supposed to be at a meeting, but, uh, but these, are, these are big rollers. They're, they're like double overhead high. Um, we were sitting on this beach. It was on the North Shore Kauai, so no, I wasn't supposed to be at a meeting. But uh, um, double overhead high waves. Uh, a storm came through and rained, and everybody left the beach. And then <clears throat> we just climbed, my wife and I climbed up into the trees and waited out the storm. And uh, storm cleared, nobody on the beach. I said, boy, it'd be great if we had a beer. And she opened up the cooler and had two beers apiece for us. And then humpbacks started jumping in the background. But, uh, <laughs> but what I was interested in was the uh, watching the sediment transport in this environment. So um, you can see the, as these waves are coming in, um, if you watch closely, you'll see boils of sediment coming to the surface. And there, you know, there's no way you're going to really be able to be out there and, and sample that directly. But you can by having sensors placed near the bottom. So I think there's a couple more nice big waves coming in. There's a big one. Cool, huh? So this is the best part of the talk. That's it. Uh, it looks like we have another wave coming in. I better not. Uh, more sediment transport. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> Whales were nice too. But. Okay, so the, the talk, I, I break it up into three parts. The first part is going over the principles of how we link the, the uh, uh, optics, optical signatures that we measure to the, to the um, particle properties. The next one is to show you an application. And this one's hot off the presses, so uh, half-baked. So if I say anything that seems silly, just stop me, because it probably is, um, from this work that Emmanuel and I have been doing in Southwest Korea. And then the last part is to uh, encourage you to be skeptical and use caution when you look at your data, because some other work that Emmanuel and I have uh, uh, collaborated on in the Columbia, there was, there was clear uh, uh, corruption of our data by things that, that uh, weren't particle related. So we'll talk about that. OK, so, uh, so real, you know, one of the things we care about most with sediment is the vertical flux. There's other things we care about. But let's just say, OK, if you want to know what the vertical flux of sediment is in the water column, which can drag carbon to the bottom, it affects how fast the water clears. This is what the equation for vertical flux is. It's simply the settling velocity. Ws times the comp mass concentration of sediment C. Um, and if, you, uh, if the particles are, are small enough, they follow a law called Stokes' law. Um, and if you, if Stokes' law gives you what the settling velocity is as a function of the diameter and the density of the particle and the properties of the fluid. So what we have here, I'll use my pointer. That would be a better idea. Sorry. OK, um, so what we have here is the density of the sediment minus the density of the water. That's gravitational acceleration. And then these are the particle diameters, uh, particle diameter right here. So th th this, uh, this uh, Stokes' law says settling velocity goes as a square of particle diameter. That's the fluid viscosity. And then this is the concentration of sediment. So if you want to know what vertical flux is in the water column, you need to know what you need to know the sediment mass concentration, that's C term there. You need to know particle size, that's the D. And then you need to know particle composition because that gives you the density of the particle. Naturally, you also need to uh, have CTD measurements so that you can get the, the uh, density of the water and uh, with the knowledge of the temperature and salinity, you can also calculate the, the viscosity. Okay, so um, the three principles we're, we're going to work on today is that uh, marine particles are typically aggregated. So the total suspended mass scales with particle area. This is the biggie. Uh, uh, this is what got me launched on this thing. Um, 
Particle mass in a solid particle scales with particle volume, but in aggregated particles, it scales with particle area, and that's what allows us to use optics to... I wonder how I tell it Tempest that I don't want to sign up. Maybe I should just sign up. But, uh, okay, so this thing's coming up on my screen here. Um, so so that's, that, that's the big one that allows us to use optics to, to estimate uh, mass. Um, the, uh, the next principle is that the particle beam attenuation depends on particle size relative to wavelength. Okay, and what that does is allow us to get an estimate of size by looking at the spectrum of attenuation from uh, suspension. And then the last principle that we're working on is that the backscatter ratio depends on the index of refraction. And the index of refraction depends on particle composition. So um, what we get from these three principles is we can uh, use optics to say something about mass, concentration, we can use optics to say something about particle size, and we can use optics to say something about particle composition. And those were th indeed the three things we need in order to get at a basic uh, uh, flux like the vertical flux. Okay, so uh, this is what I was blabbing about just a minute ago. For solid particles, conversion from an optical property to mass depends on size. Um, so uh, the optical attenuation uh, scales with particle area for particles that are large enough. It's just a, it's just a geometric thing, you know, the, the amount of light that you block or scatter depends on how much area there is between your, your sensing optics and your, your uh, transmitting optics. So it depends on area. Now for solid particles, mass is proportional to volume. That's, you know, uh, uh, you know, the volume of a sphere is, is pi d cubed over 6, and then if you want to get the mass, it's the density times the volume, so it, it goes as d cubed. So you have attenuation going as d squared, you have um, mass going as d cubed, so for solid particles, the ratio of attenuation, which is linked to area, to mass, which is linked to volume, scales as 1 over d. So why do I have this picture over here? This shows in visual uh, terms what what we're talking about here. The, all these little BBs here have the same mass as this solid uh, metal sphere here. Um, but it obviously takes up much more area. These smaller guys take up much more area. So optics, to, 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 you, you sh um, should need to know size in order to convert from um, an optical attenuation to mass. But it's not that way because much of the particulate matter out in the world is aggregated. So natural particles are not solid constant density spheres. What I have here is a bunch of images of, of uh, aggregates that we caught in a polyacrylamide gel at the bottom of a sediment trap. This gel um, is, uh, remains uh, fluid when it's not exposed to air. It's very viscous, so particles sink into it and then they stop. And then when you expose it to air, it it uh, converts to a solid. It's perfectly clear, and you can saw it up and look at what you've caught in there. So that's what we did in the, in the Gulf of Lions in France. This is a 300 micrometer scale bar. Um, uh, it was a pain in the butt to do, so don't mind that, that it was 2005. You know, you get some good pictures and you use them forever. But uh, so, so these are, these are uh, aggregated particles, and you can see that they're collections of all different things. You know, there's some big clunky uh, chunks in there. There's uh, uh, little fuzzy stuff in there. This one's all fuzzy. These are the same um, uh, flocks under fluorescent light where the fluorescence is exposing organic matter. So you can see that they're mixtures of or organic and inorganic matter and that they're loosely bound. They're not all uh, uh, packed tightly together. So because of this geometry of particles, the, uh, the mass on average is proportional to the particle area. It's not proportional to the particle volume. So now we have attenuation proportional to area, mass proportional to area, so you can use attenuation to estimate mass. So the um, yes, th so uh, some, some, some work was done in the, uh, some nice work just on fractals was done in the, uh, in the late 80s and it showed that if particles were really not, uh, not sticky so that they would rearrange that you would get uh, a scaling uh, 
a fractal dimension, I, I won't go into it, but you would get particles that, that would be a little bit denser so that the, the area wouldn't quite scale with the mass, but it'd be pretty close. And if they were really sticky, you'd have slightly looser, but still right around that um, mass scaling with area. <clears throat> so this is what we, uh, th this is what uh, got people onto this originally um, was by uh, going out with, with uh, um, devices that would image sinking particles uh, and, and then uh, compare them so you get the size and the settling velocity. Um, for solid spheres, if you remember back, which I'm sure you don't, back to the Stokes Law thing, the relationship is that settling velocity goes as the square of diameter. So this is what you're supposed to see for solids. What we, um, what we and many others have seen is that these are all uh, observations. So there's a lot of scatter, but if you put a line through there, you get this slope typically the, of the settling velocity goes linearly with the diameter. So the reason for that is that as the particles get bigger, they get less dense um, because of this, this, uh, this um, aggregated structure of the particles. So they incorporate more pore space as they get bigger. Absolutely not. So, so the, the size distribution, you know, the, the aggregates can sweep up uh, most of what's in suspension, in, in, especially in coastal environments, the ones that I care about. They can sweep up most of what's in suspension. So the component particle sizes will be, you know, go from, from right down to the dissolved limit up to like 30 micrometers, and then the aggregates are an order of magnitude larger, so that they're 300 micrometers or, or bigger. So. Okay, so uh, because of this, this uh, uh, scaling of uh, particle mass with particle area, these optical sensors are good order one predictors of mass. So this is uh, a plot from, from uh, a paper that Emmanuel did with a bunch of others uh, back in 2009, where they looked at a, a several different optical sensors in several different environments. So this is the suspended particulate mass in grams per meter cubed plotted versus the particulate beam attenuation coefficient. And while there's some scatter, you see that there's a nice linear relationship. So what this means is that, you know, you know, these, th this experiment was done in many different environments with many different particle sizes, and yet you still get this nice linear relationship between suspended particulate mass and, and, uh, and attenuation. And you can use other optical properties too, like backscatter or side scatter. So that's the reason why we can do that. Okay, the next thing is wh why, how can you use optics to say something about particle size? Now, there's, um, uh, you learned all about the list, so you can use the, the distribution of, of near forward angular scattering to say something about the size distribution. But there's uh, other simpler methods. You can use the AC9 and look at the spectrum of attenuation and from that figure out what the typical sizes in suspension are. And that's because of, of this property. So what this shows is particle diameters and micrometers going from uh, one micrometer up to um, a thousand micrometers or a millimeter, and this shows two different wavelengths of light. And this is from Wayne Slade's uh, Fast Me code. And what you see is that over uh, this important part of the particle size distribution between one and ten micrometers, that the scattering efficiency for blue light is at a, at a uh, given size is bigger than it is for red light. So if you have small particles, what you see is that you would have um, a, a steep spectrum where you would get more attenuation at the uh, or scattering at the at the small wavelengths and less at the large wavelengths. If you go out here to bigger particles, though, they have the same scattering efficiency. In fact, they converge on uh, uh, the number two. Uh, so, um, at, at for bigger particle sizes, the shorter wavelengths attenuate similarly to the longer wavelengths. So if you measured the spectrum of, of uh, attenuation, it would be flat. So you can look at the, uh, uh, how attenuation depends on wavelength and figure out something from size. If it's steep, the particles are small. If it's flat, the particles are large. <clears throat> 
So uh, Wayne and Emmanuel pursued this idea, and this is uh, from their Applied Optics paper in 2015. What's th what this shows is the attenuation spectral slope. So that's how steep or flat it is. Um, and remember I said if, it's, if, if you have small particles, it's going to be steep. If you have larger particles, it's going to be flat. So what we have is, is a, a median diameter here. It says average, so I don't know whether it's an average or a median. But uh, some representation of the particle size in suspension. These are from uh, uh, some uh, experiments that we worked on off of the coast of Martha's Vineyard called Oasis. And this is the spectral slope. And what you see is when particles are small, the slope is big, when particles are big, the slope flattens out. So if you measure this, this spectral slope, you can say something about the particle size in suspension. Yeah? Um, uh, in which uh, range of the wavelengths you calculated the slope? So it goes from, from blue to, to red. Yeah. So, so you calculate the slope across a visible spectrum. Okay. Now, okay, so what do we have so far? We have that you can use optics to get mass concentration, and then you can use optics to say something about the size. Um, and the last thing is we want to know something about the composition, and you can use the backscatter ratio to, to uh, do that. So what this is is the phase function, which you're all familiar with now, the fournier ferrand phase function, and it goes from a scattering angle of zero, straight forward, to 180, which is backwards. And what it shows is what that function looks like for different refractive indices, one representative of organic matter and one representative of, of inorganic matter. The real difference between these curves shows up out here in the backward scattering directions, where the high refractive index material has a higher, uh, has, there's more scatter than there is for the low refractive index material. In here, they're similar. In the forward scattering direction, they're similar. So what you can do is look at backscatter divided by scatter, and that tells you something about the refractive index. If you are um, high refractive index material, inorganic material, you're going to have a higher backscatter ratio. And if you're low refractive index material, you'll have a lower backscatter ratio. And uh, that's what's shown here from, from uh, an ancient paper by, uh, is this your paper, Emanuel? Yeah, Boss et al. 2004. Um, what we have here is chlorophyll over the uh, particulate beam attenuation at 660, so out in the red. Um, uh, so this is an indication of, of composition. If, there's a, if, if you have a lot of chlorophyll around, that's an organic rich suspension. Um, you're going to have low refractive indices. If there's not much chlorophyll around to, to uh, to other material that, that's attenuating at 660, then you have a higher index of refraction. This is the backscatter ratio at 532 nanometers. So what you see is in, indeed when this number is small, you have a higher backscatter ratio up around 3%. And when this number is big, when there's a lot of organic matter around, you can get pretty low down to 0.5% or 0 0.005. So here now we have a, a, a pretty straightforward metric for, for kind of what the bulk composition in the suspension is. Okay, so those are our optical parameters for, for uh, characterization of sediment. Attenuation or backscatter coefficient gives you uh, mass concentration. I could put in side scatter coefficient in there too. The slope of the attenuation spectrum um, is useful for figuring out particle size and the backscatter ratio is useful for uh, getting particle composition. Um, this, is, uh, this is the Bay of Fundy. It's just pretty. It's near here. You should go. Um, and there's sediment there which is affecting the uh, color of the water. Biggest tides in the world. Right there. Um, so, uh, you shouldn't ask me, okay, so, uh, so what, the, what the deal is, is, is that, that Nova Scotia was site of a major suture when, when Pangaea came together, so there were Himalayan sized mountains there and all sorts of tectonic upheaval. Um, after, uh, after Pangaea split up, it tried to split in the Bay of Fundy, but it failed and then moved over and, and, and split where the current Atlantic Ocean is. So since that time, 
that all of Nova Scotia has really experienced nothing tectonic. So what happened was the mountains were shedding their sediments. These giant mountains were shedding their sediments down into these, these basins. And it happened to be at a latitude that it was a very arid environment. So these are the remains of old deserts, really, um, uh, that, are, that are, haven't been very heavily baked or put under pressure, so they're very easy to erode. So that's why there's so much sediment here. And in fact, it's why the Bay of Fundy partly is, is there. It's, partly it's because it's a failed rift, but also that the, the shoreline is very moldable, so it's being molded by the tides, and it's got this, uh, now it's, it's resonant with the, with the major lunar tides, so it gets these fantastic uh, up to 17 meter tides there. So it's a cool place. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I was not that good a geologist because my ability to picture what was going on underground not so good. When I saw sedimentary rocks and they were laid out like this, it's like, oh yeah, I get that. So, so that's <laughs> that's what you get there. Okay. So, um, so now we're going to go on to to an application, and, and I just chose our recent work in Korea um, for for several projects. Now we've been working on this overall goal of linking optical properties with particle properties and, and seeing how we can use that knowledge of how optical and particle properties link up to see how we can use remote sensing to infer the, the particle properties in, in the water column. So, so this has kind of been the, our, our overall guiding figure for, for um, a while now is working on different aspects of, of these arrows linking these different boxes. So that's what we were doing in, in Korea. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as you know, uh, Emmanuel knows some, uh, some NASA people, and uh, they produced a white paper, and you know, white paper means a paper just kind of studying a topic, in, uh, in, uh, in collaboration with some Korean colleagues. Uh, and a, point A, in this white paper was, can the diurnal changes in sediment resuspension and settling be resolved with hourly uh, satellite normalized water leaving radiance data? So the Koreans have a satellite called GOSI, which is the geostationary ocean color imager. That's actually the payload. But, uh, um, and it stays in the same spot um, over the Earth and images it uh, hourly. Now, this is different from most ocean color uh, sensors, which are sun following for obvious reasons. You know, you need the light to see what's coming out of the water. So most of them follow the sun. The Korean satellite doesn't. What that means is that it doesn't get data a lot of the time, but it gets data at a temporal resolution that is potentially useful to answer questions that you haven't been able to answer with satellite remote sensing before. And this tidal resuspension is one of them. As you know, tides uh, typically go in and out every, every uh, um, six hours, and they res they, uh, if they're strong enough, they can resuspend sediment as they, they go in and out. If you only get one image a day or one every few days, you really can't use satellites to, to, look at, uh, to look at tidal processes, but this GOSI imager offers the potential to be able to do that. So this was point A in the, in the white paper, obvious reasons, um, and it turns out that there was nobody in the project who was doing anything on sediment. So, um, so what we did was we kind of slithered in through the side door and got some money from the Office of Naval Research to actually look at the tidal resuspension part of this, uh, this question. So <clears throat> these are some example images from GOSI uh, when we were out there, which was a, a year ago. Um, and the, uh, the, the basic question that we posed in our proposal is, can we infer areas of active sediment resuspension and deposition by comparing and contrasting GOSI images with the output of a model that treats turbidity as a passive tracer? So these people we work with at the Naval Research Lab have a model that just uh, would take an image and advect that field around based on the currents. So if you look at the, the comparison between the actual data and that model, if you see bright spots where there's more sediment than there should be, you can infer resuspension. And likewise, if you see dark spots where there's less sediment than there should be, you can uh, infer 
uh, deposition. So I'll just be honest, what we expected to see, which is what I'm going to show you we didn't see, was that in tidal channels where the flows are really big, we thought we were going to see those light up. You know, as tides started flowing, we thought sediment would come to the surface, and then as the tide slowed down, it would deposit. That would be kind of a conventional thing to see. So that's what we thought we were going to see. That is not what we saw. So. Um, that's what you're in for now. Okay, so what we have here, this is Southwest Korea. I should have a better locator map, but uh, I don't. So the rest of the Korean Peninsula would extend from up, up this way. So we're way down on the Southwest side. Th this brown here, that, that's the land. Um, and then this is, is, is uh, uh, the derived backscatter at 532 by, by our NRL guys. There's a little white dot here, hard to see. Um, that is where we occupied an anchor station. And what we're looking at is these hourly images from GOSI. So we start out, this is just after pink flood, peak flood. Things are pretty red, meaning that there's a lot of sediment in the water column. In fact, it's probably saturating at this wavelength. The Koreans use the higher wavelengths to get the best sediment retrievals. Um, and then uh, we're going to high slack water. And as what you can see is that they're... they're uh, uh, that there is less hot colors as you go into slack water. Um, the gray indicate clouds, so this wasn't a perfect day. Um, and as we uh, go into the building ebb, what we see is that you, um, you see that the hot colors getting hotter again, um, then as you go into low slack water, you're, you're uh, seeing some deposition. So there is overall variability, and, and I know it's hard to look at in here, but if you squint at these for long enough, there is overall variability in the backscatter related to the tides. But if you go back and look at our anchor station, it's kind of staying the same color the whole time throughout these tides. So there's a relative lack of variability in backscatter at the anchor station in this channel that we occupied, which is not at all what we expected. So um, how did we look at, at sediment on this, this uh, project? Um, here's our instrument package sitting on the back of a uh, Korean research vessel called the Young Muk. Um, I have a, a better image later on, but what we have on there is a, is a machine vision flock camera. And what that does is take pictures of particles uh, larger than about 30, um, 35 micrometers and goes up to as big as uh, 4 centimeters. Um, we have a list on there. I'm not going to show you the list data. Um, the, in this environment, they were somewhat problematic. Um, we have an optical backscatter sensor as a proxy for suspended particulate matter. We have an AC9 on there over here, um, and it's set up, as, as you probably learned about, to uh, take sample filtered water um, on the upcast through a, a 0.2 micrometer filter, and then raw water on the downcast. And by differencing these, you get a calibration independent estimate of what the contribution of particles is. Um, and from that, we get uh, the attenuation coefficient due to particles, and we can also calculate that spectral slope, which remember we're using for size. Um, there's a BB2FL and an AC9 for backscatter ratio as a proxy for composition, and we did cast every 30 minutes with this thing. The other thing that's on here are two depth actuated Niskin bottles for uh, developing our calibrations between the optical um, properties and the actual SPM. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of, uh, some of the uh, data for what we got at this, this anchor station. Um, and the, the things are all going to look the same. What we're going to do is go forward in time. This is local time, so we started in the morning and then we went through to the afternoon. Um, the color bar will show the property that we're looking at. In this case, it's the Souter diameter, which is the, um, which is, um, I, I won't go into what it is. I don't know whether we've talked about it here, but it's a good representation of, uh, uh, of what the particle size and the distribution is, if, in the suspension is. It really is as if you took the, total volume in suspension and divide it by the total area in suspension. That's the Souter diameter. So, um, but just think of it as the typical diameter in suspension. Um, and and uh, so that's what the color is showing. Um, on this axis, we have depth. Um, so we're going down from the surface down to about 14 meters. The channel was about uh, 25 meters deep. So we're only going through the upper half of the water column. Um, and then these black dots show the current speed as we uh, measured with an ADCP on board the, the Yong Mok. So uh, just to remind you, what we, when we showed up, we were going into uh, to peak flood and the currents were uh, over 1.2 meters per second. So it was really big currents, 
definitely capable of resuspending sediment. At lunchtime, uh, high slack water. Then it turned around, and uh, by the middle of the afternoon, we were at peak ebb. Um, the peak ebb is less than the peak flood. That's typical of, of tides, um, and it's because tides behave as, as uh, shallow water waves. Um, I can talk more about that later if you want. And then we go into low slack water by the end of the anchor station. So what we see here is something interesting. We see that um, at the surface, there's not much variability in the particle uh, the souter diameter. Um, there's some evidence of big particles at the surface at, at, the, at the highest flood. Um, where big particles show up is at high slack water, we see big particles appearing at depth. Um, through the whole ebb, we're not seeing any big particles at all. And then we see some starting to show up at, at low slack water. So yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, the, we just had the ADCP on board the ship. Yeah, so it did it did um, penetrate through the uh, okay. through the mud, um, but the bin sizes are huge. They're four meters, so yeah. um, so it's but pretty. It's right. There's there's there is no there is no um, or very little I should say stratification in this environment at all. So we I I won't show the CTD data, but it's like tiny variations in uh, density, and it's because it's such so energetic. It's just huge tidal currents. Um, okay, so what we see is that particle size increases at slack water, but also we see that there's a, a not as significant, but there's a, a particle size increase at peak flood. So. Uh, some of this makes sense. Some of it doesn't really make sense. So these are images from our uh, flock camera. What it's showing is this, this uh, square imaging area. Um, the scale bar on here, it's a, a centimeter. So the whole thing's about four centimeters across. And, what, and then we have a set of images at two meters depth and a set of images at 10 meters depth. Um, and what we see is when the, the current's really uh, uh, cranking, but not at peak, uh, not at peak flood, there's no big particles. So remember, this thing goes down to about 36 micrometers. So no big particles. Then when the current is at its maximum at 9 o'clock, there's big particles both at the surface and at depth. At slack water at 12 o'clock, not very many big particles at the surface, and then a bunch of big particles at depth. And then at 1,500, boy, the surface is really clear of big particles, and it's murky, but there's no big particles at, at uh at depth at 1300. So what's going on in this thing? Uh, so what we um, have going on in these times where there's, uh, there's no big particles is that these fragile aggregate particles are being destroyed by the turbulence. Now that turbulence might be natural in the water column. We know there's a lot there, but also there's heavy duty interaction with our instrument frame. So it's shedding eddies off the instrument frame. So we don't really know whether we're seeing an artifact of our instrument frame or whether it's just the energy in the flow. Nonetheless, the particles are broken up. What we see here is classic sedimentology stuff, we have flocculation and settling. So what happens when you turn down the turbulence, these particles bump into each other, the particles that had been dispersed bumped into each other, they make big aggregates, those big aggregates, as we saw many slides back, sink faster than small aggregates, so they're sinking down deeper into the water column. So what we see is some little particles up here, but a lot of big particles down here. So this is a classic uh, tidal um, sedimentology um, story where, where at slack water you get formation and sinking of these particles. This last thing is what we um, uh, are not accustomed to seeing, and that's big particles when the flow is most energetic. Remember I said, okay, the energetic flow is breaking up the particles here. It's breaking up the particles here. But when the flow is most energetic, we see particles that aren't being destroyed. So what's going on there? And this is something that, in fact, we have seen in um, another environment, another high concentration environment. And what we infer that we are seeing is that there's two populations of aggregated particles. There's flocks, so I'm using some proper terminology here. Usually you 
jump back and forth between these terms and don't really worry about it. But the proper terminology is that flocks are fragile and they have a dynamic size distribution. They form when there's high concentration and low turbulence. They break up at high turbulence and their settling velocity is typically a millimeter per second. So what we see here is that we have a flock at the seabed, it gets resuspended and, and broken up when it gets resuspended. When you turn down the turbulence, those particles come back together and they sink back down to the bottom. Aggregates, in contrast, are tough. They've been through the washing machine, as we like to say, um, many times. So they don't break up. They don't have a dynamic size distribution. It's static. They only resuspend at high turbulence because they're these tough guys. They deposit at low turbulence, and they have higher settling velocities of 10 millimeters per second, so an order of magnitude larger. So this is a completely different dynamic pool. Okay, so um, what we think is going on Oops, going the wrong way. What we think is going on here is that this um, time of peak flow, when you get up over a meter, 1.2 meters per second, that's the only time that the flow is strong enough to pick up these heavy, tough aggregates and sus resuspend them all the way up to the surface. Okay? Remember that the seabed is way below here, so you have a whole other um, 10 or 12 meters below that. Okay, so now let's look at the story that the, the optical properties are, are um, giving us because I was just talking about the camera then. So what we have is the estimated SPM in grams per meter cube based on optical backscatter. What we see is that um, the interesting thing here is that there's not much SPM in the water column here when the flows are really cranked up. And you see more SPM when, when the flows are lower. Okay. That's not what you expect. Normally you expect the flow, um, you turn on the flow, you bring stuff up from the bottom, there's more stuff in the water column. We're not seeing that here. We're seeing something very different than that. Let's look at the particle beam attenuation. It's telling the same story as you would expect. Okay, you can use backscatter or attenuation to estimate mass. It only goes down to 10 meters because that's where we switched the, uh, from, from, uh, filtered to raw water, so we can't make our estimates below 10 meters. But you see the same thing, not much sediment in suspension. There's no data here because bubbles are a real pain in the neck. Um, but uh, there's, there's more sediment around in the water column when the flows are lower and there's less when the flows are higher. So that's exactly not what you would expect. We look at the power law exponent of the attenuation spectrum. So remember, so this is gamma. If this is big, that means the particles are small. And if this is small, that means the particles are big. We see a similar story uh, where the particles are really broken up. So you have high values when there's peak flood. Unfortunately, we don't have data then so to see whether we see a, a, a change in, in gamma, and that's because it was so energetic the bubbles were getting trapped in the system. Um, and then we have bigger particles at depth at, at the slack water, at high slack water and low slack water, and that's due to that flocculation. And then in the surface, where you've lost those big particles, you see that there's higher attenuation spectra. So I think that's just great. You know, we've got two completely independent estimates, one based on the actual particle properties themselves, and the other based on optical properties that are giving us the same story. Ah. So not that you want to know, but this thing keeps coming up every 10 seconds up here asking me if I want to join up the network, but I haven't turned it off yet. Okay, so backscatter ratio, this value means uh, more inorganic, this means more organic. What we see is that you tend to get uh, um, some more inorganic stuff associated with the, the turns of the tides. At peak flow here, you're getting more organic stuff. And then when you turn around and go into to, uh, to lower flows, again here, you're seeing more inorganic stuff. So what's going on there? That means you're picking stuff up from the bottom, more stuff up off the bottom at these times, and there's less material from the bottom at these times. I'm, I'm assuming that that's what I found here, but. Um, okay, so some strange stuff going on. Um, so. This is a, a different way to look at those, uh, some of those same data. Um, now, 
the SPM, this is at one and a half meters, so just below the surface. That, that was our kind of our most near the surface observations, which we're trying to link to the satellite. But that's shown in red. It's gone from, from uh, 10 to over 20. Um, now the, the blue is, is current speed, and then it's the same time series through the day. So we see some interesting stuff here is that um, when the, the flow is really cranked up, there's not much SPM there at all until the flow is maximum. And then you see that, that some SPM um, makes it all the way up to the surface. And then as soon as the flow starts to go down, the SPM goes down with it. So that's that, uh, this stuff sinking plus flocculation and sinking here. As the, uh, current, as the current turns and starts to ebb, you see that some SPM comes up to the surface, but then as the current continues to, to increase, you see actually see a decrease in the SPM near the surface, and it, it doesn't uh, bounce back until, in fact, the currents start to, to weaken. Okay, so we see something that looks like a tidal signature here, where we have uh, peak SPM at the, at the highest tides that falls off. But this is a bit mysterious here. Why, when these currents were high, did we not have SPM here? But then we've got some real crazy stuff here. It's like, well, what's going on here? You know, as I build up these currents, I actually get a decrease in the amount of sediment in the water column. Another way to look at that is to look at, at some example SPM profiles. So now we have SPM on the x-axis here in grams per meter cubed, and we have depth in meters. Um, this is peak flood and peak ebb shown in the red, where the peak uh, flood is solid and the peak ebb is dashed line. And then we have high slack in the solid blue and low slack in the, in the dashed blue. Well, what do we see? We see that the integrated sediment load, so if you add up all this sediment between the surface down to, to 12 or more meters, the integrated sediment load is actually lower when the flow is cranked up, and it's higher when the flow is lower. Okay, that should not be, if you've thought about sediment stuff at all, that should not be intuitive to you at all. It, you know, you should be thinking, if I crank up the flow, I have more sediment in suspension. So does anybody have any dare to speculate on what could be going on here. What does it mean? Like, why, what would cause sediment not to be getting up from, from below? Okay, what do you need to do? You need to turn off mixing, right? Because mixing is what's going to bring that sediment. Turbulent mixing is going to uh, be what brings that sediment up there. So what would frustrate turbulent mixing? Yeah, strong picnicline. That's what you would normally think, okay? Strong picnicline. But we're in an environment where the, 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 the density profiles of, of the water are, there's no structure to them at all. But you're on the right track. So stratification is what stops turbulence, is what shuts down turbulence. So how could we build stratification here if we're not using temperature and salinity to do it? What do I like to study? Sediment. You can stratify a water column with sediment. So think if you're displacing a water molecule with a, with a, uh, a, a sediment uh, particle, the sediment's more than twice as dense as the water. So if you have enough sediment in suspension, it'll make the water uh, denser. Now, most of you, have, have you heard about turbidity currents? Okay, turbidity currents are these, these currents that flow down off of the continental margins and they look like avalanches. So it's really the similar process you see in avalanches where the snow is making the air denser. So what we're seeing here is suspended sediment stratification caused by that aggregate population that's lurking around below our sensors. So a, a, an indication of that is you see these things get really steep here, these uh, sediment concentration profiles. So this water down here is much denser than this water here. So despite the current being really strong, it's not able to break down that stratification at, at peak flow. The only time it can break it down at peak flow at all is, is we see some evidence of those aggregates getting to the surface. And then as the current starts to wane, what happens is the sediment falls out fast, those aggregates fall out fast. That removes the stratification, so the weaker flow is able to destroy the, the, the remaining stratification, even though the flow is weaker. Make any sense? Okay, if it does, that's good. But. 
Now, now, um, so we're going back in October. <laughs> we're going back in October. So, you know, this whole thing was about seeing what the satellite could see. So we were just concentrating on the surface. It turns out the story's yeah, down, down, down low. Yeah, so. So would you, then, in theory, if you had two rivers coming together and one was really sedimentated and the other one wasn't, would you see the same Oh, uh, you see all sorts of weird stuff. So like the, the Rio Negro, where it comes in with the Amazon, one's more sediment rich, the other's less sediment rich. So, so you, you know, there's temperature effects there too, but the sediment can really affect how the, how the mixing occurs. Now, when two rivers come together, the mixing um, is a bit easier because you're not fighting gravity. So here you're fighting, you're trying to lift heavy water up into lighter water, whereas if you're mixing laterally, you're not fighting that, that as much. So. Okay. Okay. So our hypothesis, based on these observations, are high current speeds resuspend aggregates. Um, remember, the aggregates are the tough guys. Aggregates in suspension cause density stratification, which limits the upward turbulent diffusion of sediment. Um, the more intense peak flood can mix some aggregates to the surface, but the ebb simply isn't strong enough to break down that stratification. And the stratification would only occur in the tidal channels. If you made a dense sediment suspension up on the shallows, it would slide down into the channels under the influence of gravity. So you would only expect to find these really dense suspensions in the tidal channels. Why that's interesting is that the very, that means that the variability of SPM um, is reduced in the channels because of sediment-induced stratification, and the variability is higher over the shallower areas due to tidal deposition and resuspension of flocks. So what this means is that maybe, you know, what we thought we were going to see is when the currents were flowing, we'd see a, a, a stronger reflectance from GOSI in the channels, and then when the currents waned, we'd see a weaker um, signal. We don't see that at all. In fact, what we see in the channels is this kind of flat line um, reflectance and then uh, uh, more flashy reflectance out in the shallows. So what it means is that maybe you can use these images to infer stuff that's going on way below where the satellite can see anything, um, which is kind of exciting. Um, so we're really just uh, starting to scrape the surface on this. Bor M. Lee, who uh, works over at the Korean Institute of uh, Ocean Science and Technology, just took a look at this and looked at one day, May 30th, um, and looked at the, the standard deviation and the reflectance at, at 650 um, at, a, at a shallow spot, number one, at nine meters, and at a deep spot, number two, at 16 meters. And you can see that there's an order of magnitude greater standard deviation in the GOSI images through a day at the shallow site than there is in the tidal channel. So what this is suggesting is that you could identify tidal channels that had suspended sediment stratification by looking down from space, which is certainly exciting to some people. Um, this is, uh, this is that, that May 30th, which is a day we were out there. We haven't gone and looked at specifically at how our data compare with this. Um, all it really shows, what we really need to do is the full comparison with bathymetry. What it shows is that the shallow site, there's a lot more, um, a lot more variability than at the deep site. What we'd like to do is see whether these, um, low standard deviation, um, lineations here correspond with tidal channels on the bathymetry, but we're, we're not there yet. That's, that's exciting stuff. Okay, so that's it on Korea. So, yep. Yeah, and absolutely we did. So, you know, we see, we, see we see these streaky images, and when we saw these before we were going there, we said, oh, the, it's going to be the, you know, we're going to see the high suspended sediment in the channels and then the, 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 uh, where the currents are strongest, and it's going to be less suspended sediment in the flats. Would have been real easy to infer that based on some of the, the uh, calibrations that have been done, but then you go and see that it's not true at all. Yeah. Yeah, go out in the ocean, people. Yeah. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is another cautionary tale, and I'll whip through it kind of quickly. Um, this is some other work that, that uh, um, um, Emmanuel's group and my group have collaborated on in the Columbia River Estuary, um, which uh, is between uh, Washington State, 
where it's, it's going to be 95 in Seattle today, and uh, Oregon State, where it's going to be like 105 in Portland. It's kind of crazy, but uh, um, welcome to global warming. Uh, but uh, we did some work in the Columbia River estuary, which is uh, as, a, at times a highly stratified estuary. There's a, a whole bunch of fresh water coming in from the Columbia um, watershed, which is a big watershed, and it's dumping right out into the Pacific. So um, it's an extreme environment where the application of optics would be very beneficial to understanding the sediment dynamics there. And this is really important biogeochemical areas, enormously productive. They have all sorts of dredging issues there. So it's a, it's a place that, that we need to know what's going on with the sediment. So uh, we made a, a, a bunch of profiles similar to the ones I just spoke about it at, a, at a set of stations there marked in red. And here's a, here's a, a better image of the instrument package. There's the list, there's the camera, there are the depth actuated Niskin bottles, the AC9's over here, there's a CTD, um, there's an OBS somewhere on there, uh, there's the filter intake, uh, but that's our profiling instrument package. I'm not going to talk about that stuff. I already kind of said that. So oh, look, yeah. Yeah, so on the last one, at one and a half meters on the downcast, it would, it would uh, engage the filter and then would go all the way down to 10 meters and then, no, it's the other way around. It was open going down and then the filter would engage at 10 meters and then you would get the, the filtered water on the way back up. You miss, yeah. There's ways to optimize it. Yeah. It's always, yeah, it's always a game to figure out where to do it. Okay, there's all the labels. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the, the uh, output of, of two different sensors here. One is the list, which you've been talking about, I'm sure. Um, the, the list measures that near forward scattering and, and from that uh, estimates the size distribution, but it also uh, measures the, the transmitted light and from that uh, figures out what the beam attenuation coefficient is at 650 nanometers. Um, the list has a small um, acceptance angle. So how much we've talked about acceptance angles? Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's how, you know, how, how much of the light or, or do you, uh, how much of the scattered light do you, uh, uh, interpret as transmitted. The list does not um, interpret much of the near forward scattered light as transmitted because it needs those really near forward angles to figure out what the particle size distributions are. The, the AC9 is more generous. It's got a, an acceptance angle of almost a degree saying it lets a lot of the near forward scattered light be viewed as, as transmitted. Okay. Okay. So, um, what we, uh, what we did in the, the uh, Columbia is, is generate these merged size distributions where we use the list to get the smaller particles and we use the camera to get the larger particles and we merge them right around this, this, uh, that boundary where the red line is. And I can give you information on how we do that merging, but what it gives us is a, a relatively complete size distribution. This shows on one cast a uh, uh, shallow, medium and, and deep water cast. And what we have is, is area concentration as a function of diameter here. Um, so we see that there's a population of flocks here and then there's a population of smaller particles, presumably phytoplankton, that have not been incorporated into the flocks because that's not necessarily good for them and they have strategies for avoiding that. So um, I'm sure you remember from the beginning the total area concentration should be proportional to the beam attenuation coefficient. And if we plot up the, um, for the list, the total area concentration in millimeters squared per liters, that's not too cool a unit, but that's what we have. Um, and then the uh, attenuation coefficient per meter for the list. What we see is that, oh yeah, there's a linear relationship here. And then, whoa, what happened over, over here? Um, so uh, we were concerned by these 
data when we first saw them and we were thinking is there a different particle population here what's going on um, so this is when you should always be skeptical of your data always plot up the most basic relationship you can think of in your data and see whether it's being honored and if it is still be skeptical if it's not get suspicious Great. Um, and, uh, and just to show you how much we prepared for, for doing this, Emmanuel said, talk about whatever you want tonight. We haven't, <laughs> we haven't spoken in a, in a month. So, um, so what, happened, what happened with these, these data that we saw here? The, oops. With these guys is what we're seeing is an effect of mixing in the water column that's bending the light around, um, and it's not attenuation caused by, um, caused by the particles. So what I'm talking about here is a phenomenon called Schlieren. Um, so Schlieren uh, are, are these filaments here um, in the water and what we're seeing is mixing of different densities of water and it's mixing in this filamentous way and as the light encounters those, those um, 